It always comes as a shock when people realize that some of the greatest mass murderers of history and greatest tyrants of history were actually supported and funded by very wealthy financiers and forces in the United States and in Great Britain. They sometimes go very closely hand in hand. Everybody knows about the rise of Hitler, but they don't realize that uh, the Nazi party was funded by you know, many of the banking dynasties that still exist in the United States. They funded him, the large corporations. They went into partnership with some of the German corporations. They called it IG Farben. It was a cartel. And um, they put up tremendous amounts of money as investment into the Nazi war machine. They put money behind Adolf Hitler's political party, the Nazi party. They even sent one of their uh, public relations experts, I believe his name was Ivy Lee, uh, over to uh, Germany to um, interview Hitler and analyze him and to um, groom him and to make suggestions of how to improve his public image. They were intensely interested in promoting the Nazi regime. Uh, that's a matter of record. It's not a question of opinion. Uh, you can like it or dislike it. It's a matter of record. But this always happens. Um, when Mao Zedong came to power, he couldn't have come to power had it not been for very powerful forces inside the United States. Um, at the end of World War II, um, you know, the, um, the Japanese had been driven out, but the, there was a large division in China. The nationalist Chinese under Chiang Kai-shek held um, a large portion of the country, and another section was in the hands of the communist forces, Chinese forces, under the leadership of Mao Zedong. And uh, the nationalist forces and uh, the communist forces were bitter enemies, even though they had fought more or less uh, together against the Japanese. They both knew that when the war was over, only one or the other would be um, able to survive. And so they were preparing to fight each other. The, that was not in the best interests of the people in Washington, D.C. They didn't want that to happen, and they put pressure on, uh, on the nationalist Chinese, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's government, to accept the communists into their own government in key positions, what they call a coalition government. And they wanted them to go into very key positions, in other words, in control of the military in particular. Well, that's the end of the game, you know. Um, the nationalists didn't want any part of that. So General George Catlett Marshall, who was uh, in charge of all of the military operations in the Asia theater at that time, uh, simply cut off the, um, the flow of ammunition and arms to the nationalist Chinese and made sure that all of the military equipment that was left behind by the Japanese was delivered to the communist Chinese. And with those two acts, there was no question that Mao Zedong's forces, which was now by this time much well, much better equipped than the nationalist forces, that they would be victorious. And that is how it came to be. And George Marshall even boasted afterwards. He said, with the stroke of my pen, I now disarm 30 divisions of Chiang Kai-shek's army. So that all came out of the United States. That was the, uh, the decision of the so-called capitalist forces in America that the Chinese communists would now take over China. So all of these things are contrary to the you know, conventional knowledge of what happened in history. But as I said before, none of it is really uh, difficult to find. It's a matter of uh, recordable. It has been recorded history. And it's not even a question of, of opinion anymore. So the bottom line is what? The bottom line is that some of the most brutal and totalitarian regimes of history have been funded by people of great wealth, people who we used to think of as capitalists and sometimes still call them capitalists. Why? Because they have great wealth. And uh, what we don't realize is just having great wealth is not the real issue here. It's what you do with that wealth. And how did you acquire that wealth? A free enterprise capitalist would be one who acquires his wealth through competition and free enterprise and producing products and services at a better quality and a lower cost. 
A monopoly capitalist would be one who acquires his wealth by purchasing the loyalty of politicians and the passing of certain laws to throw the weight of government in his favor and to, uh, to put obstacles in the way of his competition. So there are two kinds of capitalists, if you're going to use that word, and we have to be very clear. The capitalists we're talking about that have supported the totalitarian regimes are not free enterprise capitalists, they're monopoly capitalists, and they believe in the concept of collectivism. The issue of bank bailouts is a very simple one. You can make it complicated, but at its core, it's a very simple issue. And that is that the, the banks who own the Federal Reserve System, it is a cartel of banks, have great influence over our federal government. And when the banks got in trouble and were about ready to go bankrupt, most of them, if you looked at their balance sheets, uh, they were technically bankrupt because they had made so many bad loans to uh, third world countries or large corporations and these countries and corporations were no longer able to continue paying interest on these loans. The bank was coming to the point where they had to write these loans off as bad loans. That would have destroyed the banks. They would have gone under. They were going out of business. So they went to their friends in Washington and they said, look, we need to save America. They didn't say we need to save the banks. They said, we need to save America. If the banks fold, well, then who knows what will happen. America will go down. And so their friends in Congress voted these billions and finally trillions of dollars to make all of this happen, to bail out General Motors and Ford and various countries and the banks themselves. And um, it was offered to the American people as a, a, a great move on behalf of America. This is how we were going to save America, by saving the banks. It almost worked, except for the fact that by this time, enough people were aware of the game. They knew that the Federal Reserve System was creating money out of nothing, and they knew that that would result in their having to pay the bill, either in the form of taxes or through inflation, ultimately in the form of inflation, because the politicians are not willing to increase taxes as much as they should in order to pay for these expenditures, so they always keep the taxes as low as possible. And, but they collect it through inflation because by pumping this new money into the economy, it waters down the purchasing power of all the money that's there. So when the voters realized that they were going to pay these bills, it wasn't the government paying these bills or bailing out the banks, it was the citizens, the consumers that were bailing out the banks. When they realized that, they got angry. And there was a great movement against it, a lot of anger, and especially when they found out that some of these executives were you know, getting million-dollar bonuses for bankrupting their banks and so forth. There was a lot of uh, heat. And uh, by the way, I think that the whole issue of bonuses, as important as it is, was a side issue. I think that that was one of those tricks that the media uses to distract the public attention from the real issue. The real issue was the fact that the Federal Reserve and Congress was creating all of this money out of nothing to bail out the banks. That was the real issue. It was going to bankrupt America. It was going to drive people out of work, out of their homes. It was, it was going to destroy America. But did they talk about that? No. They talked about how bad it was that the president of some bank got a million dollar bonus. And that was where all the attention went for quite a while. So that was a side issue, at least in my view. Um, but, so there we have it. Uh, what can you say? Uh, even though the people are upset about it, it didn't make any difference because the people do not control their government. They think they do, but they don't. Their politicians are beholden to the banking fraternity, to the Federal Reserve, to the banking cartel. That's where the power resides today. And if you need to have any proof of that, all you have to do is just take a look at the recent history of the bailout of the banks against the will of the majority of the American people, against the anger of the majority of the American people. And nevertheless, Congress went right ahead and did it. The President of the United States endorsed it. Everybody was for it at the top, but at the bottom, the people did not want it. So how is that possible? If the people control their own government, could that happen? No. It's proof positive that the people of the United States have lost control of their own government. The anger over the bailout of the banks has been a strong fuel for the Tea Party movement. But uh, the question is, will the Tea Party movement be able to do anything about it? 
And the answer is no, not unless they replace those people in Washington that made it possible. A Tea Party movement has no value unless it has the effect of replacing the people in Washington who brought about the financial crisis. And that means all of them. It doesn't mean just Democrats or Republicans. It means all of them. And so the Tea Party movement, I'm afraid, now is there's, a, there's an attempt to, to have it become a mouthpiece for the Republican Party and make it look like everything that's happening in the economy and the bailing out of the banks is all the result of the Democrats, and it's not. They certainly play a major role in it, but it's all been going on for decades, and the Republicans have played a major role in that. And some of the very Republicans who are standing up today and saying, we should, uh, you know, we should just put an end to this bailout of the banks, they're the ones that voted for it in the beginning, but nobody's checking their voting record. So yes, the anger of the American people over the bailouts is fuel for the Tea Party movement, and that's good. But now the rest of the story is, will the Tea Party movement be able to remain independent of the political influence of the Republican Party.